Good afternoon. Hashtag I'm staying. I hope everybody's doing well on this beautiful Friday afternoon. We are going to be speaking in a couple of seconds to Dr. Eleanor from the, from, um, the University of Pretoria. Uh, she works for the Department of Family Medicine. Now, um, one of the most contentious uh, issues at the moment that we've been discussing are related to whether or not to wear face masks. And I know that this has been something that's been up for debate. Uh, all across the country, all across the globe. Um, I put up a, a post a couple of days ago regarding face masks and we got one heck of a response back. So uh, hopefully we can get a little bit of clarity on this from the good doctor. Um, if, you are, if you are watching this, uh, please know that you can also follow us on, uh, on our website, www.imstaying.co.za. Doc, how are you doing? Well, and you, Jared? Can't complain. Thanks. It's been uh, it's been it's been quite a good day. We've had some interesting uh, interesting discussions already, and and uh, we're so happy to be joined with you. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you also. Great, Doc. Tell us uh, tell us a little bit about how your week has been uh, since we spoke to you last. Any new developments? Anything exciting? Anything that you want to share with us? So our clinics have started. I told you the previous time that um, as part of the university's protocol, we're working in four informal settlements. We're actually working all over the city, but I go out and collaborate with people for four in, in four informal settlements. And that's Amazama, Malusi, Woodlane and Cemetery View. And the ISF forum is also very active on Facebook and they post some of the stuff that we do together. They work with us here in the East. On the west of Pretoria, we have other members helping us. And so this week we ran our first clinics on three of the four sites. We saw over 100 patients between all of these sites. And happy to say some were put in self-isolation, but everyone's clinically stable. And no one except for one patient met all the criteria that included having a traveling contact or, or having been traveled. And um, so things are looking okay. Um, we just have to keep to the self-isolation and the distancing, which is really difficult in the informal settlements. And that's where our concern comes in from a family medicine perspective of how can we, for as long as possible, keep our informal settlements safe because their people live very dense. So what sort of measures can we, can we put in place um, with, regards to, with regards to this compact living? Because it's obviously a challenge. There's a number of people staying in one space. The spaces are really uh, closely... Um, uh, closely knit. Uh, what what sort of measures can we put in place from a self isolation? I mean, what do we say to a family that's got you know five or ten people living in one space? So I mean, the reality is, um, people that are in a very close environment that only have one room, they don't have a separate room. All will have within two to four days, on average, symptomatic uh, symptoms of coronavirus if they contract it, and they're very likely to get it. So that's one of the reasons why we're moving towards masks for all and going to have this discussion today. And secondly, we then ask families if one person is symptomatic um, that they quarantine or self-isolate. We support them with a food pack. We're driving food packs through Lyft's NPO. They're managing the funds so it's transparent so that if someone wants to donate towards food, they can donate money because we also don't want people packing food within informal settlement sites and bringing in uh, coronavirus. So uh, we have on the ISF forum visibility on how far we are with the food packs. We receive more money and we'll update that tomorrow once we've bought more food and worked out how much we can still buy. But from our perspective, we had a dietitian on the team and Marion developed a food pack for us. I see the president last night spoke about what they will offer. And the food pack we developed is very similar to this, although we developed it a week ago and she started sharing on what we're gonna buy with it, except that we do offer some more protein than what government can currently afford to offer in our food packs. Okay, that's fantastic. So there's been a lot of, uh, there's, well, you know, I mean, we're sitting in a time that's, that's quite uncertain. There's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, debate around the right way, the wrong way. I mean, in your opinion, how do you think that government is actually performing in terms of this lockdown? And do you think that they're doing enough uh, at this stage? Listen, I think we responded very early. And I think we can see from top to bottom, the president started speaking early on about what the measures are that's necessary. And it's really harsh measures for us personally to take on, but this was necessary. 
Um, our stats don't look that bad up to now. We've seen between two days ago and yesterday a steep rise in numbers of people that tested positive and there's th this debate are we testing enough, enough people? Are we missing 50% of people that are positive, that are not that ill? For me, the focus should not be on that. I think if people are really ill, they will come in. The reality is if people don't self-isolate, more people will contract it. And we're still very early in winter. So prevention is better than cure. And especially in a scenario where people are still debating what the remedy would be. So there's, um, just with regards to testing, I mean, do you think that we are doing enough testing? I know that we've, uh, it looks like we've been quite aggressive in setting up these, these little testing sites all over the country. Do you think that there's, there's enough in the way of testing and, uh, and that, um, that we, we can expect the numbers to increase quite dramatically over the next period, the next couple of weeks, days? Yes, you know what, um, from a clinical perspective, one would expect numbers to rise. From a personal perspective as a mother and just as a member of society, I would really want to hope that um, our numbers don't increase dramatically. And there are a number of things that work. And one of it is self-isolation. And there has been graphs that indicated if you lengthen self-isolation, then the curve completely flattens. And um, they have put numbers to those days. They've also showed that if you have more than one lockdown, repeatedly. So I think the message to South Africans should be, if we don't listen, if we don't flatten the curve, if people don't self-isolate, if they don't wash their hands, and if you can't do that, then you should wear masks, and we'll discuss that now, then um, the numbers will rise again very shortly after our, we have 14 days left have ended, and then it will force us into another lockdown. If you've just joined us, we're talking to Dr. Eleanor regarding the, the current state with regards to uh, Ravona, with regards to Corona and uh, what measures are in place and, and, what, and what they are personally doing on their side. Um, one of the big things, doctor, that we, we want to focus on in this discussion is obviously views around wearing masks. Now, there's been reports from the World Health Organization that uh, masks are not the answer, that we shouldn't be wearing them. There's been a, there's been a, a whole different side of discussion with regards to Masks are important to wear because not only do I protect myself from you, but you protect yourself from me or vice versa. Now, is it, uh, is it your opinion or is it the, 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 the medical opinion currently in South Africa that we should or should not be wearing masks? So, I mean, it depends which medical professional you speak to, but uh, within our Department of Family Medicine, this is also a discussion, an ongoing discussion. There was a very nice video about masks and statistics, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the stats and graphs. And so many of us are of the belief that masks for all is the way to go, especially if you live in a highly densely populated area, especially if you can't self-isolate properly, especially if you don't have access to enough water to wash your hands 20 seconds for how many times a day. So, so where, is the, where is the debate coming on? I mean, what, what is the other chain of thought here? Why are they saying that masks could potentially create more, more, more harm than good? So, I mean, the U.S. Surgeon General posted the 29th of Feb, uh, and this was a, a big post. He sparked a lot of what um, was said by big guns around the world, but he said it's not effective in preventing general public from catching corona. And it said, but if healthcare providers can't get them to care for the sick, then it puts communities at risk. So the question was asked, so how can it protect a healthcare worker but not a general person of the public? Um, because that statement in itself is nonsensical. What he was trying to say that ineffective usage of masks are more dangerous than doing good and um, that health cares, uh, health carers have had a shortage of masks because people have bought them up and that should not happen. And so there's been a force coming from medical professionals, but also the general public, where people started saying, okay, but what can we do? What type of other mask would also work? So that I leave the N95, the gold standard respiratory mask for the health professional that does use, that does need it. Uh, let's talk about poor handling of masks. So what would be the risks? I mean, so just so our, our viewers out there can, can familiarize themselves with proper handling of a mask and how to avoid contamination. Let's just discuss that a little bit, please. So I think the one thing that we all do, and I want to do it if I talk about it, is we touch our face. 
And the one thing that you shouldn't do is touch your face when you put on the mask from the neck up, it's as if this part doesn't exist. So the whole idea is you put on the mask after you've washed your hands and you make sure that there's nothing on your hand. And then when you put it on your face, you don't touch here and here, you put it on, position it, and then you leave it. You only take it whether it's the taxi, whether it's I'm sleeping next to someone else and I don't have another room and I'm coughing at night. When I take it on and off, I go outside, I don't have the droplets that are inside, contaminate or go onto my hands and I touch my beloved and I don't fiddle with it during the day. So when you put it on, we tell the community health workers when we're in the informal settlement, no touching of your face, no nothing. You can only take it off after you've cleaned your hands. The moment you take it off, we spray it with alcohol. We let it air dry at night in their rooms and open windows. When they put it on the next day, preferably they should have a second mask. And we'll talk about material masks and different masks and what they've shown about effectiveness. But the less you touch here, the better. So that's a huge challenge for me. I mean, I'm constantly touching my face and, uh, and, and rubbing my beard. And, and I've, had a, I've had a number of, of people remarking on the platform already that I should stop doing that. And I'm trying, people. I promise you that I'm trying very hard. But um, so, so that's, I mean, that's important, right? Uh, uh, the, the, once, you've, once you've used a disposable mask, should you reuse that mask again? Is it something that you should throw away? And let's talk about homemade masks, material masks that are made from fabrics. I mean, let's just talk about proper handling and care and the effectiveness of those. Yes, yeah, so I think the first thing we should say is if we're going to use paper masks and we're going to use it indefinitely, it could be months, it could be I don't know how long, we're going to have a lot of waste. And if we promote people using paper masks that they want to dis dispose of, especially in informal settlements, we're going to have a potential dump site that's more dangerous than not wearing a mask. So we have to find an alternative that fits our environment and our current challenges. And if you make an appropriate mask out of material, it is of uh, good enough quality, not like the N95, but you're not working in a hospital where under certain conditions a virus can be aerosoled. And that happens when you do a bronchoscopy, that do, happens under certain EMT procedures. That doesn't happen to the general public. So for the normal person on the street, doubling up on a t-shirt is actually a very effective way of making a mask and I'll talk about other measures but um, I know a lot of people are not convinced that wearing a normal mask or a face mask works and that that should be the norm for the public. So I want to mention that um, in Taiwan they're making 10 million masks per day and um, they're not even on the chart if you really look at number of infected cases. They've only had two deaths They've only had 153 positive um, covered cases. They're not just flattening the curve. And this is Miss Distance um, that said this. She said they're annihilating the curve. They don't really plot um, what's happening in Taiwan because all of them are wearing masks and started wearing masks before the major spread earlier in the year. And it's been proven to be effective in that country. And they're not the only country. We, we saw Czech Republic coming on board, uh, making mask wearing mandatory. And so more and more countries are debating should they or should they not. And the Czech campaign started in March on the 14th. There was a social media influencer, his name is Peter Ludwig, and he made an educational video and he cited a study by the University of Cambridge and they conclude that surgical masks are three times more effective than homemade masks. But they said, nevertheless, they recommend homemade masks as a last resort when surgical masks are not available. And so that discussion actually had many people come up with what can we do and how can we compare a homemade mask to a surgical mask and what can we do to improve the quality of the mask to prevent the penetration of the nano micron molecule that covered virus. So the bottom line here is that is that some level of prevention is better than no level of prevention. First prize is obviously to have something that's surgical, something that's fitted and something that's, a, that's professionally made. But still, it does serve purpose if you have something that is a wraparound scarf or some level of material that you can put to cover your nose and mouth to stop you from giving the tra transmitting onto somebody else, correct? Yes. 
So all the countries that have controlled COVID-19 and isn't currently in lock lockdown has done all of four things. They all did rigorous testing regardless of symptoms. They all did rigorous contact tracing and we had our Department of Health say today that they're still struggling with contact tracing. They're really working on improving contact tracing and I think it's really important and they're really open about where they have to work on what they're doing and that's a good thing and if the public just collaborates and really is open about if they've had a contact and come forth early for testing, there's a testing site, for instance, at Swanee District Hospital. Within 24 hours, you have your results. They're talking about rapid testing, which means through the Department of Family Medicine and Infectious Diseases at UP, someone can come in if they don't have a medical aid, they're afraid, I couldn't afford to have the test done. They could have it done there and they would have the results. And if the rapid tests become available, people will have the results within minutes. It could be 45 minutes and it could be as little as five minutes. And then I'm not talking just about antibody testing. It might also later on be a rapid PCR test, which is a very good way of um, deciding whether someone has been infected or not. And then the fourth thing or the third thing that they've done is they've quarantined their infected. Now, quarantining in a country where people live in informal settlements and they are mobile, mobile at night is very complex. Um, and we see that. We, we know that even if the police comes out and they do come out to the informal settlements through the ISA forum, they phoned and contacted. And by the time they do come out, 50 of people have sat outside and made dinner together because they live in very small spaces. And so the fourth thing that all of these countries did was masks for all. And I think that's why for us, um, it's such an important component of being successful in the drive to flatten the curve and keep it low. Fantastic. If you've just joined us, we're talking to Dr. Eleanor from, uh, she's from the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Pretoria. Um, just, to, just to let you know, you're welcome to send any questions and requests. If you have any questions for the good doctor, just let us know and we will throw them uh, towards the doctor for, for answering. If you've missed the first part of this discussion, we're referring to the fact that, that um, we, the question was raised that are, health ma are masks uh, detrimental or, or, do, or are they actually effective? So just to give you a little bit of a recap, the consensus is now, although there is different, differing of opinion, the consensus now is that wearing a, uh, a mask is better than not having a mask. Wearing a surgical mask, a professionally made mask, is better than wearing uh, is better than 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 uh, using uh, something that's homemade. But anything is better in in terms of prevention than than having nothing at all. And um, and uh, just going back to some of this the this, the discussion, uh, Dr. Eleanor was telling us that in, in countries like Taiwan, is that correct, Doctor? Yes. In countries like Taiwan. Taiwan and uh, Czech Republic. So one in the Czech Republic, they've, they haven't just flattened the curve, they've annihilated the curve. These guys are producing 10, uh, 10 million masks per day. It is mandatory for you to wear a mask in these countries. So we know that the, the wearing masks are effective at flattening the curve. Um, Doc, so just to give us a little bit of insight, uh, a, little bit, a little bit more, I mean, is there anything else you want to tell us around this? So um, I think the one thing we must remember, remember is that people are infectious before they're symptomatic. And so if you wear a mask, you're not only protecting yourself, you're protecting other people. And that's also what we want to do. It's sort of our individual public duty to protect our neighbors um, when we are potentially infectious. And we don't know that beforehand. So that's another reason why wearing a mask works. Um, and so if we look at mask wearing, we can talk about what the efficacy of the different masks are and the homemade masks. I actually took a photo of a slide that I want to share with you guys on different masks. So this is um, a breathability of a homemade mask versus a material or a surgical mask and also the efficacy. And um, if you look at household materials, let's say you want to start making a mask at home. They've looked um, at different materials against uh, 0.02 micron particle. So to put that in perspective, the COVID virus is somewhere between 0.1 micron. So this is less than that. Okay. So they looked at a surgical mask and they said it's 89% effective. 
Then they took a vacuum cleaner bag. There's a very nice video going around about vacuum cleaner bags putting being put into a mask that you make at home. And that filter you can take out again. So that's 86% um, effective. That's really high. That's almost as high as a surgical mask. Then if you use a dish towel and you fold it double and then use it over your face, 73% um, effective. And then we look at cotton blends like a t-shirt. So they also recommend you can just use part of a part of your t-shirt, even if you don't even cut it up, you put it over your face, especially if it's a double uh, layer of the t-shirt, 70%. And so they looked at pillowcases, linen, that's um, in the high 60s. And a scarf, if you were to use a scarf, 50% effective. So the reality is if you are not, symptom uh, not symptomatic, but you are positive um, for COVID or you've, you have been infected and you do wear that, those small particles will not be suspended in the air. It's going to be on your clothes. You can throw it in the wash. If you don't touch your, your face at that time and then put it on something else, you won't infect, some, infect someone. And so we are starting to hand out handmade masks at our site. Um, for instance, at Woodland this week, the church through Lyft NPO are making very nice uh, facial masks for us. I got a Hello Kitty face mask, which I love because I was a Hello Kitty fan as a, a child. And we're promoting that. So patients that come in and cough, when we send them home to quarantine, they get a mask to wear for the next two weeks. That they can wash and reuse. Fantastic, Doctor. Thank, thank you very much. Let's just do a little bit of Q and A quickly. So we have a request here from Alvira van uh, Oswegen. How do you keep a homemade mask clean? Is what she wants to know. So I mean, if you're making your mask from t-shirt material and you've doubled it up, you wash it. You have a couple. You have two. You have one for the wash and one you can wear. And you put in your vacuum cleaner bag, you cut that up and you put it inside if you want to increase the efficacy of it. If you don't and you just wear it as a dish towel that you've doubled up and you have more than one, buy one dish towel, cut it up, make two masks. It's not very expensive. Take an old t-shirt with a nice pattern and then cut that up. It's really easy to wash. If you wash it tonight, hang it in your window. Tomorrow it's going to be dry. You can wear it again. Okay, fantastic. A style... Uh... Estelle Mozzellini asks, um, do you know what the costs of uh, involved for testing? So as I said, currently, if you don't have a medical aid, you're symptomatic and you're not covered to, to be tested. There are testing sites all over the country. I live in Pretoria, so I can speak for Tswane. You can go to Tswane District Hospital. There's a tent outside. They're not really busy. They're open. They're willing to help you. You can have your test results within 24 hours. And when the rapid test have arrived, it's going to be within 45 minutes. If you have a medical aid, and most medical aids have said that they will cover people that have been insured through them, the costs are currently about 850 Rand, and your medical insurance will pay for that. Okay, fantastic. Tsukhafatso uh, wants to know, um, so I think you've already touched on, on reusing uh, uh, face masks, but what about surgical glove stock? What about the surgical gloves? I mean, those surely are a problem. Yes, I mean, we have limited supply, so we don't de-glove after every patient. We do, however, use hand sanitizer between patients, but we currently don't use our gloves for more than one consecutive day. We are unfortunately in the position where we have to reuse surgical masks or our E95 masks that our team has, and so we spray that with alcohol. We prefer to have more than one so that one can dry over a day or two, and that we are sure that if there was any virus droplets on the outside that it has um, disseminated or died. Um, otherwise, we, um, if we have to, after a couple of days, if it's a surgical mask, we don't have a lot of N95s, we don't really throw that away. The surgical masks, we will then, after a few days, um, start wearing a new one. Okay, Shirley Smith um, says the following. She's concerned about taking high blood pressure meds because it's said that it affects the effects of the meds uh, on your cells can make the virus worse. Do you know if that's correct? You know what? It's better if she does take the high blood pressure medication and especially diabetics. They're a very high risk group. If you have uncontrolled diabetes or you're insulin resistant, please make sure that your sugar is controlled and below 7 millimoles per liter. 
if your blood pressure gets too high, your risk is higher. So rather take the medication. The guidelines currently state that people can take the medication and we would want them to take the medication because it does increase their risk for comorbidities more if they don't control on a chronic disease. Doc, do you, do you perhaps know where people can get tested in KZN? Do you have uh, any details around that? No, I don't. So it depends whether it's private or public, but the moment you phone Lancet, Vermark and Vermeulte, Ampat, any of them, they'll tell you where the closest testing site is. Um, if you're in the public sector, just phone your nearest public hospital, speak to the emergency desk, and they'll be sure to tell you where you can go for a test. All right, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Eleanor, this has been a, a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for joining us again. We'd like to connect with you next week, if that's okay, and just to, just to see where things are. Yes, that would be great. Wonderful. Always a pleasure, Doc. Thanks for giving us your time, and uh, look after yourself. Take care. Thanks, Jared. Same to you and to the listeners. Bye.